Journal of Wildlife Photography, and I'm here with Elise Bender, one of our regular contributors. Bender is a nature photographer, writer, tour and workshop leader, and a Tamron USA ambassador. She's currently based in Texas, USA, and she's made a name for herself as a proponent and advocate for ethical nature photography. She leads nature photography tours through her own business, A Bender Photography, and Wild Side Nature Tours. Her work has been recognized nationally in the United States as well as internationally, and she has written for the journal since summer 2020. Bender, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you so much for having me. So I've got a couple of questions for you so our readers can get to know you and sure. your experience a little bit better. They've been reading your work for about two and a half years now, but this is a, an opportunity to meet the person behind the page and behind the camera. So how did you get your start as a wildlife photographer? So I started out with a camera in hand when I was about knee high, very, very young. And I explored nature through the lens. You know, at that point, it was a point and shoot 35 millimeter camera. So the lens wasn't very long. But as I grew and my interest grew, not just in nature in general, but wildlife and animals have always been very near and dear to me, you know, growing up with different types of pets, but also kind of more in a rural setting. So I had wildlife around me. I was very taken by that. And some of my early childhood readings included things like zoo books. And, you know, then as I, I got older, I would read biology books, learning everything I could about wildlife and nature. When I was in my teens, my parents ran an ecotour business, which also, you know, just, you know, led to me wanting to know more about nature, introducing people to nature. And then when I went digital, one of the first lenses I bought outside of a kit lens was a 70 to 300. And that was so that I could start working on getting better wildlife images, you know, closer to what I was seeing in the magazines and in these publications and books that I'd been reading all my life. And then from there, it just grew to where that Yes, I'm a nature photographer. I love everything from, you know, the megafauna in in Grand Tetons all the way down to, you know, macro and floral subjects in my local botanical garden and parks. But wildlife, you know, given the choice, if I'm in the field and there's, you know, a beautiful scenic view or there's, you know, a moose standing in the pond that's in the scenic view, I'm photographing the moose. So wildlife has really, you know, I will do it all, but I really kind of target wildlife before anything else while out in the field. That makes a lot of sense. What would you say is the type of wildlife you enjoy photographing the most? Oh, that's that's a hard one. I was going to say, I kind of like everything from from zero to six legs, but some of my favorite subjects would be things like moose in the Tetons, red crown cranes in Japan, humpback and orca whales, you know, along the Pacific coast and kind of wherever they are. But I'm, I'm really a very opportunistic uh, wildlife photographer. I will target certain species at certain times based on, you know, behaviors and whatever I'm looking specifically to photograph. But if I'm just out and about, I will take anything that crosses my path, whether it's a beetle, a bird, or, you know, something larger. So <laughs> sounds good. But it sounds like centipedes and millipedes are not maybe your favorite after you know, I, six I, legs. <laughs> you, you are not going to see any jumping spider macros in my macro collection. No, yeah. I, I'm, I'm working on it, but I can't bring myself to do it. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> I gotcha. That's good. So that's, you know, talking about the, the types of wildlife you like to photograph. What are some of your favorite places to photograph animals in the wild? Anywhere there's wildlife. If I had to choose one, I would say Hokkaido, Japan. I just absolutely adore Japan in general for nature photography, but winter wildlife in Hokkaido is a, it's just so special. I, COVID, I was going up there almost every year, five, six times. I lived in Japan for two and a half years, just 
there's something about red crown cranes dancing in falling snow. You have the full stellar sea eagles that overwinter from Russia coming down along the coastline, you know, fishing from drift ice. You have all the little Ezo red foxes running across these snow covered landscapes. It's just a magical place to me. And it's not nearly as cold as, say, Yellowstone in the winter. So that makes it a little bit more tolerable for me, who I was born and raised in Florida. So it's kind of just that perfect little niche where you have amazing wildlife in a absolutely stunning landscape and the food the people the culture it's all so wonderful like I just I I really quite enjoy it so that probably is my favorite place if I had to pick one I'm trying to remember the uh, the snow monkeys that you wrote about for the the winter issue are those in Hokkaido No, they aren't. They're actually further south. They're about three and a half hours by train outside of Tokyo. So they're on the mainland. The main the the main island of Honshu also has incredible wildlife opportunities. They're just spread a little bit further apart. It's a larger island, Mm -hmm. and but you get beautiful snow. Like like I said, if I had to pick one, it's Hokkaido. If I have to pick a country, it's Japan. If I just you know, in general, I love going anywhere there's wildlife. So <laughs> I hear you on that. <laughs> so what have been some of the most challenging things you've encountered while photographing wildlife? That's, you know, that could be, you know, challenging experiences in the field, kind of general challenges you've had being a wildlife photographer, you know, you, you've encountered what have been some of the most challenging things? So I'll just acknowledge that COVID was very challenging. Luckily, we're kind of coming out of that. But beyond that, in general, I would say there's been certain species that it's incredibly hard, especially here in kind of the South Central U.S., that it can be incredibly hard to get access to because so much of the land is privately held. So things like when I wrote on the lesser prairie chickens, those were all photographed on private property. And I had to wait until there was a specific festival going on that offered the opportunity to go out on these landowners property in order to photograph them. Here in Texas, it can be incredibly hard to photograph certain species because once again, the vast majority of the state's land holdings are on private in in private hands. So that can be a challenge. On the flip side, it can also be challenging to be working on pri- on, on public lands because so many people especially after COVID have found the outdoors and so in these concentrated areas such as Grand Teton, Yellowstone, many of the national parks here in in the U.S., and even now into the state parks and other, you know, Bureau of Land Management public lands, there can be quite a high concentration of people in places that several years ago, you may have seen one or two kind of groups come through, and now there's quite a flood. It's a double-edged sword. I love that people are getting out and exploring nature and kind of reconnecting. The difficulty comes when they aren't necessarily doing it in a respectful manner for either the wildlife and the environment and or those of us who are also out there to enjoy it. So that can be also difficult. And, you know, I do have to put out there that there have been some difficulties as a female and being taken seriously. So I'm very thankful that the journal has been quite open about, you know, equal opportunity across the board for for us contributors. So, but yeah, that has been, those are just some of the challenges. I understand that. And, uh, you know, like the journal, we, we do just try to recognize, you know, talent and experience. So we're delighted that you're a regular contributor with us and, and love that our readers can benefit from your experience and knowledge. What are some of your go-to equipment brands? Well, I'm sure many of you heard in the introduction, I am a Tamron USA ambassador. I was using Tamron lenses 
well before I ever became an ambassador. I became an ambassador in 2020 and I go back to at least a decade before that using Tamron glass. So the glass came first and my love for using Tamron glass came first before the ambassadorship. So that is one of my entire lens kit is now Tamron glass. And so far as camera bodies go until just this past summer, I was Nikon my entire, you know, once I went digital, my first digital was a Nikon Coolpix. And I went all the way up to D500, as I'm sure many journal readers will see. If you go back to any of the articles, you'll see it's the Nikon D500 that I was using for almost all of my images that have been submitted. Nowadays, since August of 2020, 22, I did switch to Sony mirrorless. And so now I'm on the Sony A1 as my camera body, still using Tamron lenses though. So those are my, my two go-to name brands at this time is Sony and Tamron. When it comes to accessories, it's kind of all over the, the board with a Benru tripod. I also will use a platypod, especially when working with macro. I don't really do any artificial lighting and, you know, and my backpacks, that's probably the other big piece of equipment that I have with me at all time. And I use Atlas packs. They have really, to me, knocked it out of the park as somebody with back issues from being in the military. It's hard to find a camera bag that'll be both a camera bag and a travel bag so that I can carry some clothing and trail gear with me along with the camera gear and that is still comfortable to the point where I can use it all day and Atlas Packs has done that by doing packs that are fitted to the person so they have multiple size framing much like your traditional hardcore hiking backpacks do and that's really kind of and they have all the pockets and all the the bells and whistles so I have plenty of places to store gear as well so If I had to pick three top brands to look into, it would be Tamron, Atlas Pax, and Sony. So, Sounds like you've been pretty happy with the the switch to Sony. uh, It's done a lot. Yeah, mirrorless in general, the live histograms are (laughs) (laughs) life-changing. As a photographer, to me, that's just like the the most life-changing point of it, like that I can just see the histogram move as I make changes, as the light changes. It's just, yeah, yeah. So. Excellent. So that's about your your go-to equipment brands. Do you find that you have any go-to settings that you find yourself using over and over again? Really for aperture, especially for wildlife, 7.1. An f7.1 is kind of the sweet spot for me for most of, for quite a bit of my wildlife. It just seems to give me enough depth of field to capture my entire subject with detail, but it also gives me those soft foregrounds and soft backgrounds that I like so much and that are kind of what I go to when photographing wildlife. So I, if I had to pick like one setting, that's my go-to. And then I adjust shutter speed and ISO as needed, typically starting out. And this was even before, you know, on digital SLR or mirrorless for wildlife, I typically will start my ISO at around 800 and adjust from there as the lighting and action dictate. So excellent. That's great advice. All right. So what are some of the most common mistakes that you see novice wildlife photographers making? Two that come to mind. One would be always centering their subject in the frame. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's plenty of times and places where that works, but to always do it and then, you know, plan on cropping afterwards. I use crop. I'm not an anti-cropper, but to continuously always frame your subject in the center, I would say trying to move away with that will help improve your photography and wildlife composition. 
The other one that I see a lot of struggle with, especially in novice and even up into intermediates, is when you have a bright subject, say like whooping cranes, which are a five foot tall white bird, and we're out on, you know, the marsh flats in the central coast of Texas is making sure you're getting your metering right so that you don't blow out those highlights on those feathers of that white white bird. So just learning how to change your meter mode. I always suggest two clients coming out with me with the whooping cranes to do spot metering so that you can meter directly off of that white bird and those highlights on that white bird and adjust from there so you don't lose any of that detail. Makes sense. Thank you. So this is kind of part two of that question and you know, this a little bit, but so what tips do you have for newbies who are just starting out or intermediate photographers who want to step up their game in wildlife photography? I would probably my number one thing, and it's something I do myself still to this day. I think it's just part of the growing as a photographer through and and as an artist throughout your career, throughout your interest in the hobby, in in the profession, is studying other people's work. Uh, When you study other people's work, you're able to not necessarily, I'm not saying go out there and like copy them, but figure out what it is about particular images or particular artists that you really like their their images that they've created and, you know, sit down and analyze why, and then see if you can't start implementing those into your own work, whether that's composition, whether that's a particular type of lighting that they, that they find or that they use, you know, by doing that, you're able to then analyze your own work and say what works and what doesn't work in your eyes as an artist. It will make you more detailed about what you're considering a good piece of of work so that you're not just putting every frame that you create out there. It'll help you start building a quality portfolio. And then as time continues, you also develop your own style. To me, if somebody can say, I looked at that image and I knew it was yours, that to me is a is like one of the highest compliments because then that means I have found my signature style and that can evolve over time. Again, as our likes and dislikes change over, over the years, we implement that into our work, into our portfolio, and there's nothing wrong with that. But to me, that's what I would say. One way to step up your, your game in photography is to study what you like and what you don't like and become more critical of your own work makes a lot of sense. All right. What, what do you wish that more wildlife photographers would do? And I guess the flip side of that, what are some things that you wish that wildlife photographers would stop doing? (laughs) So I just, one of my wishes is that we would be more responsible in how we photograph wildlife. I wrote an entire article for the journal on ethics in wildlife photography, and that covers a lot of my take on it. But just being aware of how we impact an environment, how we can impact the individuals that we are photographing, and make sure that we're having as little impact as possible. We have to remember our subjects are wild. There's nobody, you know, For the most part, there's nobody hand feeding them. They have to actually go out and survive without the help of humans. Like, you know, our dogs and cats have the the privilege of living in our houses and, and not a care in the world, basically. But if we impact wildlife to the point where they run away, that's burned calories. If they do become, you know, dependent on handouts or seeking humans for as a food source that's one burned calories when they don't get something from someone as well as it takes them out of their kind of natural habitat and brings them closer to 
human habitation and can get them in quite a bit of trouble. All we have to do is look towards the the bear situation in the Tetons to see what some of the ramifications from that can be. So once again, just kind of looking at those types of impacts, both first degree and second degree impacts on our subjects and then treating our actions appropriately and when it's not worth pushing the animal in order to get the shot. That's very good advice. And I'll I'll add another thing that I, I really appreciate that you do in your articles. I feel like there's a lot of wildlife photographers, mostly, you know, hobbyists, you know, that can be all levels of, you know, amateur to really expert. Um that they they go out and they take amazing photos and they have these incredible opportunities and then their photos never leave their hard drive. And so one thing that I really appreciate that you always do in your articles is you share different ways that people can use their their photos for the conservation of these animals that they're going out and they're shooting. And so I think that, you know, that's something that we all can be doing a better job with. And I really appreciate that your articles give some specific examples of things that people can do, you know, as far as sharing them with conservation organizations. And I mean, you know, just social media. Yeah, it does. And thank you. Yeah, because I really do think it's important. You know, I care a lot about obviously, (laughs) obviously I can, I can get on a soapbox, but I care a lot about protecting, maintaining and preserving wildlife and their habitats. And, but I realize I'm only one person. And so one of the things I love being able to do through the journal, through my tours and workshops is teaching people how to come out, photograph these species and their habitats, and then take those images, take those experiences back to friends, family, strangers on the internet, (laughs) and share those because when we know somebody who has gone through something, we typically care more about it because we have that personal connection. And so to do that with wildlife photography it's going to take an awful lot of us to protect as much as we can that's still existing and is, you know, we know that there's constant threats to many of these species. I like to say, unfortunately, I have job security by writing about species of special concern because the list gets longer every day. So by being able to contribute, whether it's through citizen science, whether it's, you know, donating images to conservation organizations, or just sharing with pieces of information, not just posting a pretty picture, but saying something about the species, about your subject and the environment that they're in, can have a huge impact, you know, with the spread of information and getting more people to care about about these habitats and and the wildlife. So absolutely. Yep. The more they know, the more they care, the more that they get involved. Yep. All right. So last question for you. Well, actually, I'll have an extra question at the end here. What would you say is your most memorable wildlife photography experience? Oh, that's so hard. (laughs) It's like asking me my favorite place. I've had so many really great experiences in the field. Well, what was the first thing that popped to your mind whenever I asked that question? So I, and it's, it's funny because my background's the, the pronghorn over here. <laughs> and, and maybe it's because I have that picture up that this was the first thing that popped into my mind. But to me, probably one of the best experiences I can have in the field and that I have had in the field is when an animal trusts me enough to come and investigate. I don't hmm. instigate anything, you know with pronghorn, they're out in the open. They know that I'm there. I don't try and hide because that's what predators do. So I will stand there respectfully at a distance and not, you know, I'm not going to flush them. I'm not going to chase them. I just wait for action to happen. And one year when I was in the Tetons, I had a buck that decided, I don't know what this is. I'm going to go check it out. 
There was no aggression in his body language. There was no, nothing but curiosity. And he just approached slowly. I didn't move because once again, I don't want to scare him. I don't want to cause a negative impact to this animal. And he got within probably 15 yards of me before I started backing up. And as I backed up again, doing it slowly, he kept advancing on me. And at a certain point, I did have to like, be like, okay, just kind of, I didn't want to startle him enough to make him run off, but I had to like get him to stop coming towards me. And again, no aggression, no stomping of feet, ears were upright and just, you know, listening, looking, you know, when he would hear a sound, he would stop and kind of look over, but you know, then he'd turn back to me and just kind of try to kind of get a bead on me. And, you know, there, there wasn't, like I said, there wasn't any aggression, but I've had that happen multiple times with multiple species. And to me, that's kind of one of the best things that can happen is when the animal wants to be a participant. And again, I don't try and make anything of it. I don't try, you know, to, to get them to come closer, you know, for a better picture, but, you know, again, if that's what they want to do, I'm, you know, I allow it within reason. (laughs) So those are the ones that I remember the most and just kind of give me that feeling that, oh, they've, they've kind of accepted me. They aren't scared of me. And so that kind of just warms my heart a little bit. Absolutely. Wow. That's pretty special. And uh, you went ahead and you answered what was going to be my final question for you, which was, where did you take the photo of the pronghorn in the background? But you already said, so that was, so. that was a different, that was a different experience. That was a different time, but that was in Grand Teton. Gotcha. So that's a uh, Wyoming USA. All right. So thank you again for taking the time to, to be here with us and give our readers a chance to get to know you a little bit better. And just a quick reminder to people to look ahead at your upcoming articles. We've got the winter issue. That's making making molehills out, mole mole out of mountains. Thank you. That's a really neat article for two reasons. And I encourage people to check that one out. So that's started when Bender went to Yellowstone in June, 2022. And within 24 hours of her arrival, found herself in the middle of a 500 year flood. So she was going to shoot some low elevation pica and do an article about those for the journal. And suddenly escorted out of the park and was not able to go back in and was not able to complete the assignment. And so she tells some of that story in this article, but also talks about how just the unpredictability of nature and, you know, the realities of working in wild spaces and with wild animals you know, if you're going to be a wildlife photographer, there's some rolling with the punches that you need to do. So that's a pretty exciting article. I'm, I was very happy to have, to have her contribute to the journal. So anyway, well, thank you again for taking the time today and we appreciate you being here. Thank you so very much. I look forward to putting out even more articles. Sounds good. It's been lovely talking. Okay, all right.